I'll tell you right now, I'm at Ashland University. And at Ashland, I'm the interim department chair for communication studies. And I'm also the director of professional development, um, specifically our Center for Innovation and Teaching Excellence. So I'm very excited to be here with you today. I have been a full professor for more than 20 years in the business and communication areas. Um, I've taught more than 20, taught and developed more than 20 different courses. And I've definitely seen a shift and a change in my students over the last 25 years, as I'm sure those of you that have been teaching for a long time have as well. So I'm really excited to get to spend about 40, 45 minutes with you and talk a little bit specifically about the research, about who today's students are, what employers are looking for in students as they graduate. And then I wanna share just kind of six strategies or techniques, tools that I'm using in my classes to really engage my students today. So you can see kind of the questions that'll guide us. We'll spend about the first 30 minutes on the first two understanding who our students are and what expectations are of students of the 21st century student. And then end with some specific strategies or techniques as we um, move our students forward. So let's go ahead and, um, and begin. So um, I want to start out with a little bit of demographic research, and then we'll look at some psychographic research and look at who our students are. So let's look demographically. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have some excellent articles and sites that, that really are a compilation of um, different data about who today's 21st century student is. So I put some of those statistics up on the websites or up on the webinar so that you could see those. And here's some things I think that are interesting to me. As I look at this, first of all, one of the things I find really interesting is the, is the percentage of students that are working today. That more than 60% of our students in our classroom are working full or part-time in addition to going to school um, full and part-time. I thought another really interesting statistic is the diversity that we have in our classrooms today. You know, a very diverse perspective as we look at whatever our content area is. I thought the next to last statistic was especially interesting to me, and that is the number of students that are taking an online class, a completely online class. And that's about over a quarter of our students are taking online classes right now. And um, the QM Connect Conference, I had an opportunity to attend some of those sessions, and they shared some really interesting statistics that, for example, 5.8 million students right now are enrolled in an online course, and that's about a 263% increase over the last 12 years. And I think that kind of plays into, that's a, that's a demographic piece, but I think it plays into a little bit about who our students are, how they're using technology, how busy their lives are, and the kinds of things that maybe they're looking for in the classroom as they um, move forward. Ironically, the Online Learning Consortium just posted a white paper and an infographic, and they were looking at online students, and 90% of online students say that their experience in the online classroom is as good or better than their experience in the face-to-face -face classroom. And I, I found that really interesting because I do teach in multiple modalities. I teach online, I teach flipped and blended classes, and I also teach face-to-face -face classes. So um, I'm, I would be interested in what faculty think about that, if they think the online experience is the same, different, equivalent um, as the face-to-face -face experience. Nevertheless, our students are reporting that their online courses are just as fulfilling, just as meaningful, and they're learning the student learning outcomes at the same rate as their traditional face-to-face um, -face courses. Also, if we look at um, some research that was done by the Educational Advisory Board, EAB, um, and they, I went to a session called Supporting Students in a New Learning Economy, and they came up with these kind of four general statements that I wrote down during the presentation that kind of highlight a little bit about who our students are and how they're changing. So I want to share some of this information. The first thing that they said is that our graduates today are facing a very different job market than what our students 25 and even 10 years ago did. And they called this, the, the concept they called is Uberization 
of employment. And they talked about how employers are hiring graduates. So for example, they're saying, we expect that students are going to graduate from college with technical skills. But what we're looking for is do they have the soft skills? Can they work well in teams and groups? Do they have good interpersonal communication skills? Can they write well? Can they speak well? Um, can they think critically? Can they? Do they have the ability to produce new ideas for our company and think critically? And one of the things employers said is, I'm really looking at hiring internship students so I have the opportunity to try those students out first. And I think that's always been the case. But one of the things that we really that we really see as a change is that many companies are reporting, according to the Educational Advisory Board, that, that employers are saying, we are looking for students that already have experience. It's not, a, it's not enough just to have a degree. How are you giving them experience as colleges? Then they looked at the other side of, of once they're hired and they said, students, new employees really have to consider the fact that this is a new learning economy. The technology is going to replicate itself about every 18 months. And we all know that students today will have many careers and many jobs, but that the career that they are in right now, even if they stayed with the same company in the same career in 18 months will look very different than it did when they started working. And in five years will probably not even resemble the same career. So they're looking for students that, that, really have this focus on lifelong learning that will go back for, for after they get their associate's degree or their baccalaureate degree and to continue that learning process, continue that certification process, to stay current on what's really important, this very occupational shopping and frequent job changes. So that's the first thing the Educational Advisory Board said. The second thing that they said that I thought was really interesting is that they focused on the, the decline in high school graduates, the number of students that are graduating from high school. Not that more students aren't graduating from high school, but that there are fewer high school students. And when you look at the goals that universities have, that we're going to have to look in other areas to continue to drive enrollment at our universities and our colleges. And they talked about things like online and the impact that online learning is having, specifically that um, students have a lot more op opportunities and options for colleges because of online. A third thing, and I thought this one was really interesting, is they looked at some Google Analytics and they noticed that there's this dramatic rise in students searching for, is college worth it? So these internet searches that focus on, is college, is it worth going to college? Do I really need a college education to do what I want to do? Um, and they, they focused on some um, interesting points when they looked at that, and I want to just read one specific to you. They went back and they looked at the hallmark years for higher education, especially it started around 2008. Um, but this dramatic increase in students searching, what is a college education really going to do for me? What, what skills am I really going to learn besides content level skills? And then finally, um, they looked at some of the Obama initiatives and they said, we're going to need as a, as a country about a million additional students graduating each year to maintain the economic um, health of the United States. And as they go through, they looked at some of the things like moving um, the United States from 12th to first rank in college attainment. And that, of course, was a goal by 2020. And the cost that it was going to take $52 million is what they estimate um, to uh, be able to, if we don't increase our productivity as, a, as colleges, what it's going to take to, to attain that goal. So as we look at just some of those demographic factors, fewer students, more students working in addition to going to school, looking for alternate pedagogies or modalities to be able to reach those needs. What does it mean? What does that mean to us as college faculty? What do our students want and what do our employers want? So now that we've looked at a few um, demographics, I want to talk a little bit more about some psychographics. So who are our students? And I, I want to preface this by saying we're, we're putting students together in groups based on the life experiences that we've had. But certainly we recognize from the very beginning that not every student falls seamlessly into one of these groups or behaves the way that psychographics would say these students behave. If you have students that are closer to one end or the other end of one of these age groups, if they've been raised in a different modality, um, 
the students may behave a little bit differently than, than what we're, we're suggesting. So um, why, why we look at what some of the research says about these groups and how they may behave in the classroom, we certainly recognize that there's all spectrums of the way that students behave. But the idea behind this is that is that common life experiences, common things that have happened, affect how these students see the world and thus how they behave in the classroom. And of course, my experiences affect how I see the world and how I might teach or try and connect to my students in the classroom. Um, so I wanna go ahead and share some things. I have some really great articles. You can see all of my newspaper articles. I'm a little bit of a research geek, so I love to pull research and try and better understand my students. And I think one of the things that I've learned is there is no right or wrong. You know, loving technology or um, being afraid of technology or hating technology, there is no right or wrong. My goal as a faculty is to reach my students where they are. And I really believe that 20 years ago, my students were different than they are today. Now, that doesn't mean different better or different worse. And it doesn't mean, and I think inherently, they still have the same desires to be included, um, to be part of a group, to have somebody care about them, to change and make a difference in the world, to find remunerative employment so that they can live the life that they want. I, I think we still have these common things, but the way students process information, the way they learn, attention span, I think those things have changed over time. So what I want to do is spend about 10 minutes and look at each of these three groups, either because these might be students that you have in the classroom or because this may be a group that you fall into that impacts the way that um, that, that we teach and that we learn. So let's start out and look at our first group, baby boomers. So this is the group that are in their 50s and 60s in the classroom. I certainly have these non-traditional students in my classroom. Common life experiences shape the way that we see the world. So people that were raised in this generation, once again, maybe a little before, a little after, things like civil rights, Vietnam, rock and roll, television, nuclear threat, all of those things kind of shaped the way the student sees the world. And a lot of the information that I'm going to share comes from one of my favorite books. It's called um, Generation IY, Our Last Chance to Save Their Future by Tim Elmore. That might be a little dramatic, but um, I, I think it's really great because it breaks down different generations and in the classroom and what we need to do as educators and mentors to um, help these students be as successful as possible, both for our world and for themselves. But here's some of the statistics they say. Obviously, if you're looking for people in these gener this generation, Oprah and David Letterman and Spike Lee and Janis Joplin. Um, but here's some of the research says. When these students are in our classroom, they might have a little bit of mistrust of authority, but a respectful mistrust. These are students that wouldn't come up to me and say, Professor Orr, I disagree with the answer, the, the, the grade that you gave me on this assignment. They will just simply endure authority. Relationships for them are very useful. They, they seek to build relationships um, to, with their faculty members, and they seek to build these relationships because they understand the usefulness, the utilitarian purpose that relationship have. Excellent interpersonal skills. Once again, that's a generalization, but most, for the most part, the research would say they have really great interpersonal skills. Technology has come and gone. And you have to think of some of the technologies that were here right at the very beginning, like calculators and televisions. Think in the 1970s, the slide rule was the sophisticated technology we used to do on the go calculations and algorithms. Um, think how different, I mean, in 1970, the first kind of handheld that looked like, you know, a little suitcase, a calculator came out. And think how, how far, how much has changed today compared to just, um, to just them. When we look at this group, whether you're in this group or some of your students are in this group, one thing that's really interesting is the focus on career and the focus on um, their jobs. Career for this group is part of the identity of who this group is. So if you ask somebody in their 50s or 60s, tell me about yourself, probably one of the very first things they're gonna say is what their job is. Because it's not like it's something that you just do, it's something that defines you. I know that I had a lot of students that came back to school that were older students, baby boomers, that lost their jobs when manufacturing went out of business and when companies left. And as they came back, it, you, it, it was a real hurt because their jobs weren't 
weren't just something that they did to take care of their families. It was part of the identity of this group of people. I create my future. I live to work. My future is part of who I am. Here's something very, very interesting. Um, this group, now this is according to research, was the first group of students that were part of grade inflation. So often this group of students comes in, first of all, expecting to give 100%, expecting to be able to earn A's in their course because that's what they're used to. So, you know, coming in with these realistic expectations that maybe in every class we can't master all the SLOs in one semester and that's okay is a real issue for some of these students that, that come in. And by the way, this is about 78 million Americans right now. All right, let's go ahead and look at my next group. And the next group of students that we have is Generation X. These are our students that are in their, their later 30s and their 40s. So these are our students that we might consider our non-traditional students. So in our later 30s and early 40s, some of the life events that really shaped and affected the way this group of students sees the world are things like Watergate. So we should be hesitant and maybe mistrustful of authority. Um, MTV came out, the HIV and AIDS epidemic came out, so being concerned about health and safety, the Challenger explosion happened. Um, this was the era of the PCs, and ironically, here's, um, here's something very interesting. This, this group right here, when they graduated from college, likely, especially if they're in their 40s, students today have more powerful technology in their hand in a cell phone than they probably had if they, when they graduated from college or if they graduated from college. So this is an era that uses technology. So if they can find something useful in technology, they'll use it, but can enjoy a day away from technology just as much as a day with technology. Here's what Elmore says are some things to understand about this group. Um, as far as authority goes, they just kind of ignore them, tolerate and kind of ignore them. Um, Julia mentioned the self-correcting typewriter. Let me tell you, I had one of those when I was in college and I was like the most popular girl because you could type an entire sentence and then hit return and it would type it out for you versus having to use, you know, the little sheets with the white out in it. So, it, you know, it's a very, it was a very different way of doing things. And let me just, let me just mention this. If you're in Generation X, and you would go, or, or baby boomers, and you would go to write a paper. You would go to the library to find your research. And the library was open Monday through Friday until six and Saturday, eight to two. So right away, you really had to think about time management, right? So you had to go to the library. You had to look up the resources in the card catalog. You wrote all of your notes out on a piece of paper um, as you were taking notes. You organized the information. Then you would go home and you would hand write it all. And then of course you would type it up and then you'd have somebody proofread it and you'd be thinking about the content. Did I have a lot of specific nouns and action verbs? Were there enough examples? Did I include, is it the right amount of ages? all of that, then somebody would proofread it and then you would retype it again and then somebody else would look at it and find one error that changed all the page numbers, you'd retype it again. One paper might take you um, two or three weeks to write and you really had to practice this great time management. So today some of my students come in the classroom and they're writing three or four page papers in one night. And then, and I say, oh, you know, I want more critical thought, but it's not really the student's fault. It's not right or wrong. It's just they have access to all of this great information right up front. And they're not forced maybe to have the kind of time management skills that maybe some of the previous generations had to have simply because we didn't have access to the kind of information. So when I look at my students today in time management, I think, how can I help set them up for success with time management? in my classes versus expecting they're going to be able to do that. All right, here's some other things. Um, they enjoy technology, will use technology. Here's in the classroom. They're comfortable with active learning, although they're not totally adept at using technology. So when I get some of my 30 and 40 year old students, they might say, I don't know how to do this or how do I upload this or I'm afraid I'm going to break this or this doesn't seem to be working. And we tend to give up much quicker today, just as a nation, instead of, of sometimes focusing through. Um, but 
so, you know, this is a group that really needs a lot of instructions, things written out, screenshots, help uh, moving through. They like bullet points. Get down to the main point. Tell me what it is that I need to know. Give me um, graphics. Okay, I'm going to tell you one funny thing. This is also the generation that they say is the first generation of evil children movies. So the first generation, sometimes you hear this generation called the unwanted generation. I don't think that's true. But you know, an age when it maybe wasn't as desirable to be a child. But think of some of the movies that came out in this group of children, of adults' lifetime. What gremlins, good at child's play? Anybody else have a movie? I came up, I was trying to look at some of the movies like Rosemary's Baby, um, Exorcist, Children of the Corn, Freddy, good, there's another one, um, The Omen. But kind of like these evil children movies came out during um, this time. Not that I think these adults, think that they're evil as children, but the idea is these kind of experiences for the first time, you know, maybe, okay, The Shining, excellent, uh, maybe shaped the way that they saw their reality and, and who they are and, and what maybe they need in the classroom. All right, let's go ahead and jump to the, the group that we're most likely to have in our classroom. And of course, um, this group is Generation Next. So Generation Next are gonna be those students in our classroom that are under 33 years old. And this is probably the majority of the students that you have in your classroom. So students that are somewhere between your very traditional students right out of high school, all the way up until, you know, they're the, what we would still consider non-traditional in 30s. Let me share some demographic and um, some statistical things about this generation next. Who they are, how they behave in our classroom, and maybe what they need to be successful. Once again, I, I accept that we're making some generalizations. Let me share just some interesting pieces of information. I um. I had a class yesterday morning, and in preparation for this, I asked my students, how many of you have sent at least one email yet today? And my students literally looked at me like I was an alien. And they're like, oh, Professor Orr, we don't send emails. That's for old people, you know, like you. And um, I was like, really? You don't send emails? Because statistically, we send, um, as Americans, about 1,800 emails a person every month. So I know that we are actually sending, um, sending emails. Let me share with you some other statistics. I also asked my students, I said, how many of you have sent at least one picture or one video of yourself before you came to class this morning? What percentage of my students do you think had said they had, had done that? Nearly 100%, you're exactly right. Nearly 100% of my students that had said they had sent at least one picture or one video of themselves before they had come to class. The average was five, just so you know. So I did some research and I looked, I looked this up and we, sent, we will send about 1.8 billion, 1.8 billion digital images every single day as humans. 1.8 billion images a day. Interestingly, 700 million of those are going to be posted on Snapchat today. So 700 million photos on Snapchat every single day. And just to give you an idea of how many pictures that is, in two minutes across the world's population, we take more photos in two minutes than even existed 150 years ago. So if you took every photo that existed 150 years ago, we take more photos than that in just two minutes as humans. Here's another interesting statistic. Statistically, 99.8% of Generation Next has cell phones. If you're interested, 12 to 17 year olds, 78% of them have cell phones. So 99.8% of cell phones, 96% of those cell phones are smartphones. So think of that. When I graduated from college, I had to go to career services to do my resume on a floppy disk. If I wanted to use career services, my students in their hand have a technology more powerful in their hand than I had when I graduated from college. Students will check their cell phones on average 66 times 
every day. 66 times a day, the average American will check their cell phone. And you know, when I do things like try and force my students to come to my learning management system or force them into email to get updates from me, it's not that those resources are bad, but if my students are on their cell phones, then that's where I wanna be. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about giving them my cell phone number, but I'm talking about how can I use a cell phone that they're already very, very connected with to um, engage them, to get them thinking about the course content when they're outside of my course versus trying to force them into a technology or non-technology that I'm comfortable with. Let me give you some other statistics just for fun. This group of students, on average, when they are on the computer, they will have eight windows open at one time on their computer and will jump to a new window every 11 seconds. So think of that, the change in attention span. You may have seen the several months ago, US News and World Report had a, had a um, picture of a goldfish on the front page. And there was an article that talked about attention span and how much shorter our attention spans are today than ever before. And that people feel like they're experts because they have this big breadth of knowledge that we get from the internet, but very, very little depth to back it up. And I'm sure you may have seen that in your classes when students come in and kind of feel like they know a lot about the topic because they've got this big breadth of knowledge, but, but the depth of knowledge, the really studying the SLOs, is something that we're trying to encourage students to do. All right, let me give you a couple other interesting um, statistics about this group. Remember I said they'll check their phone 66 times a day. Well, this study went on and asked students, if you use your phone in class, what percentage of you use your phone in class, even if your faculty say you can't? And they found that about 90% of students said they will continue to use their phone in class, even if they're not allowed. But here's something interesting. 88% of students said they realize they miss key information when they're on their phone, but they're so afraid of being disconnected that they're afraid of putting their phone down. So how do we really get them to connect to their, their classmates? I know in my classes, I have something called Technology Tuesdays, and I challenge my students to bring in a technology that relates to the, what we're learning about the SLO for that week. Um, and a technology that relates to it to turn them into the teachers in class. And they love that because it's kind of like stump the game master, right? Bring in something that Professor Orr doesn't know about. And then they're up there teaching the rest of the class. On the other hand, I also have my technology free Thursdays where we really focus on developing those soft skills, those interpersonal skills, that eye contact, that working in small groups and teams that may not um, revolve around technology. Okay, so just some, you know, interesting information about technology and how students are using it. Um, I found some other really great statistics like this group, this, this generation of students have pro has probably never popped popcorn anywhere except in a microwave. Isn't that crazy? Or they've never ridden their bikes without a helmet and knee pads. They've never ridden in a car without a seatbelt. And that's a great statistic, right? Um, or without a car seat. I, I mean, I know for myself, I used to ride in a car without a car seat. As a matter of fact, I rode in a car without a seat, right? Does anybody here remember riding on the hump in the front seat? You would call the hump because that way you could um, drive while your mom smoked out the window. Um, or, you know, riding in the back of a truck. And you know, my parents were safety conscious, right? You had to actually sit on the bed of the truck, not the tire well when you were on the highway. But, um, you know, this is a very, a very different generation. They have had different experiences. Um, they've, had, they've had different opportunities. They're a much more protected generation than any generation um, in the past. Let's look at what this, this group of students say that they need in the classroom to be successful. All right, so in the classroom, this is what they say. When this group of students in general approaches their future and they look at their future. They see their future as a place to serve. They see their job as a place to serve, to make the world a better place. They anticipate having many jobs and many careers in their lifetime. They're optimistic about the future and the impact that they're going to be able to have in the future. Um, interestingly, 
Tim Elmore says that these students will talk more about who's going to work for them than who they want to work for in the future. And somebody just used the word authentic learning. And I think that's a really great term to use in, in conjunction with these students to look at using the technology, but using it in a way that authentically helps them learn and embrace and move beyond the knowledge level of thinking. I'll give you an example. In one of my classes, I always sent out weekly emails to tell them um, what they were going to be doing for the next week to help them with time management and preparation. And one of my students said, oh, we hate reading email. You know, that's for old people. And I said, well, how do you want me to connect to you? Like, like how can I meet you where you are? And they said, well, if you would tweet us our updates, then we would get those. And I said, all right, I'll meet you where you are and I'll tweet your updates. But here's what you have to do in exchange for me. I'll tweet you, but you have to follow five companies that you would like to work for someday or five people in the industry you want to go into that um, you would like to emulate your career after. And then every week on the discussion board, you have to post something that you've learned based on what they've tweeted. Well, literally, my students laughed at me when I asked them to do that because they were like, oh, Twitter's social. We're not going to learn anything. But once they started following companies like ProMedica, the largest employer in Michigan where I was, once they started following these employers, they realized they were posting job opportunities, internship opportunities, looking for volunteers to do the race for the cure. Um, it, we had some of the best discussions about, about smoke-free policies um, when you're hired at work and the impact of that from a business and ethical sense. All of a sudden, students really started thinking critically about the content they were, they were absorbing and seeking out on Twitter. And we had these amazing discussions because of what businesses and individuals were posting on Twitter. By the way, I had three students that got internships from that activity, which was not my own activity. I found it on Merlot.org if you ever go on there and get any great ideas for uh, what you can do in classes. But it was really a fantastic resource for my students. All right, so here's, how, here's what they say they need in the classroom. They love technology. They're energetic. They're confident. They're capable. They believe they can succeed in any course. They don't do as well with lecture as they do with activity. This is the YouTube generation. Give me little bites of knowledge, little bits of information. Give me an opportunity to apply it, to work with other people. They expect immediacy because they're used to having that kind of 24-7 feedback information, connection, and helping them connect the dots, tie course goals to academic, uh, academic gains is really um, critical. Let's go ahead and look at one more result before we jump into six activities that I'm using in my classes really to make an impact. So Chloe's survey results looked at online education, and I saw many people posting on the chat saying, I've been thinking about getting into online or not really sure how that's going to work for my students, but I know students want it. Um, and here was some interesting, if you, if you go to any of the QM thing, this webinar is actually up. You can go and look at the results. They looked at about 180 different schools, and they were looking at things like, do you, flavor, do you favor blended classes over online? And do you require faculty to work with instructional designers? But one of the interesting things is they talked a lot about new pedagogies that colleges are considering. And if you have a non-traditional student base, andragogies working with the adult learner. But they were looking at things like lecture capture, gaming. I saw a lot of people mentioning things like Kahoot, one of my favorite games to use in class. As a matter of fact, we used it yesterday. But gaming and game-based learning. And um, you know, they're looking at all sorts of new technologies to engage and interact with students. So if we look at what our peer colleges, and I like this survey because it breaks it down by private colleges and public colleges and two-year colleges and community colleges. So you really get an opportunity to look at what your peers are doing in relation to what you're doing um, as well. So let's go ahead then. I want to jump into and talk about just a few things in the last 15 minutes that we are, um, that we're, that I'm doing in my classroom that I really think is impacting my students. And here is a, a great quote Here's, I think, what my students need in general. And I just, I love the enthusiasm that this young group brings in, their passion for the world, their passion for meeting students. And, um, you know, I, I have to be honest with you, I was a little bit kind of um, 
technology reluctant, let me just say, maybe I would have called myself a tortoise. I loved my overhead projector. I made sure I got to class early enough that I could get the best one with the best bulb. And, you know, it was, it was kind of tough for me to step outside of my comfort zone and say, gosh, my students really want to use their cell phones in class. And how can I turn that into an academic tool versus a social distraction? Um, you know, they really want to embrace learning outside of class. They really need this immediate feedback. Um, how can I really engage my students? And so here's three things that I found that, you know, my students really need a compass, not a map. They're, most of my students today are not linear thinkers. You know, they don't sit in a seat for 60 minutes and listen to my lectures. You know, they, they need direction, they need guidance, they need support versus a step-by-step -step plan for their success. I attended this great keynote and he used this analogy and I loved it. And, the, and what, what he said is, if we were gym teachers and we were preparing our students for the presidential physical fitness test, we wouldn't stand in front of them and do 25 push-ups and 10 pull-ups and then say, all right, you, you feeling more prepared for the test? You ready to take it now? Oh, you're not? Okay, well, watch me do 25 more. And I think when I was a young faculty member, I did a lot of the push-ups for my students. I prepared these great lectures. I gave them handouts of the notes and all study guides for the test. And I found that I was doing so many push-ups for my students that they weren't doing the work for themselves. They weren't getting stronger. They weren't engaging with the content. And once I stopped being the sage on the stage and moved to being the guide on the side and providing support coaching, direction, um, analysis, examples, feedback, that students really started to succeed. Um, engaging the critical and creative thinking, and so many of you have said on the, ch on the chat, I want my students to think more critically about the content in my course, not superficially. And then finding creative ways to deliver the content, ways that my students are already connected to, to be able to deliver the content. So let's go ahead and, and here's a couple statistics for you. Um, Dottie Walters and her book, Speak and Grow Rich, and William Glasser and Choice Theory, both come to the same conclusion, and that is students learn and retain what they experience directly and what they teach each other. So if I can get my students really into experiencing the content, connecting with each other, teaching each other the material, they're much more likely to be successful in my classes. So let me go ahead and share um, some of the technologies and the tools that I'm using in my class. And I want to tell you, I was a little reluctant to kind of embrace technology, even as I started to understand who my students are and how I, how I needed to meet their needs. Um, but I actually did a survey of 60 different research studies. And what I wanted to better understand um, is how can I reach my students? How can I meet them where they are? And is technology going to be um, an important element in this? And this is what I found. And there are some negatives about technology, there's no doubt. But the top two, technology will engage students in the content. And an engaged student, a student that feels like they're part of a community, is much more likely to persist when the going gets tough. And it will enhance student success. And that's what I want. I want my students to leave my classes having mastered those student learning outcomes, being able to scaffold to their two and three and 400 level classes or on to graduate school, and most importantly, be able to apply those skills knowing they're going to have to be lifelong learners to continue to be marketable in today's economy. So I want to share six quick strategies or technologies that I use. And listen, I could spend a whole day sharing hundreds of these kinds of things, both that I use in my classes and that other people have shared with me or that my students have brought in. But I just wanted to pick six quick, quick ones to talk about what I'm doing in my classrooms. So here is one that my students brought me. Remember when I talked about how students want to change the world, want to make a difference in the world, and I want them to study the content in the class? So one of my students came in and said, I bet you've never heard of free rice. And I'm like, get up here in front of the class and tell me what this is. And it's actually a flash card gaming site that you can go to, it's free. And you can't create your own, your own decks, that's a disadvantage, but here's the advantage. If you're doing something in the humanities, you're studying authors or what have you, and there's a deck created, every time you match a flashcard or play the game, 
it adds 10 grains of rice to your bowl and you see the bowl filling up with rice and at the end of your study session it donates that to children in third world countries so my students were so passionate about this um, because all of, they feel like they're giving back to the world and they're doing something. I love putting students in groups and teams in the classroom and they go through and they review these flashcards. So what they're doing is they're focusing on the knowledge level content, the terminology and the, and the words, but at the same time they're giving back to causes that they really believe in. Super fun site. I never let my students out of class early, not even 10 minutes. So if we have 10 minutes left, they're coming up with some kind of game that we can play and they love going to free rice and playing this game. So that's one idea that I really like. Here's another one, augmented reality. I don't know if you're using augmented reality in your class. It's literally amazing and changing in so many ways what I'm doing in my classes. So obviously augmented reality is just when your videos come to life for your students. So this is a free site. I found it because I was at Disney and we were gonna wait in line and I saw this little purple arrow and it was like, if you wanna know if this ride's worth it, use augmented reality. So you hold your phone up and the video of the ride comes to life. In this case, it was 3D and you can see if it's worth waiting in line. And I'm like, there's gotta be a way to use this in education. So this is how I use it. You take any media source, a uh, uh, paper, a uh, video. I shoot short videos like just in time instruction on my phone. And then any place on the syllabi that my students see a picture, they know they can hold their phone over that and a video of me will come to life talking to them. Think Harry Potter about that project. So if it's a quiz they're preparing for or a midterm exam or they are um, uh, it's spring break and they want to get a head start on a on a prod on a project. They literally hold their phone over their syllabi and I come to life talking to them at that about that element. My I have my students create these. They're called auras and then I upload them into my both my online course and my face to face course and they absolutely love it. There's thousands and thousands of auras. If you download Erasmus and hold it over a $1 bill, you're gonna see a whole project come to life. So there's a lot of public ones. You're gonna get a copy of this presentation, but I just wanna mention one thing. If you do decide to do these, these are my tried and true tricks to learn. First of all, upload a black and white picture, because if it's not a black and white picture, you have to download it in color. And second, your students have to follow you when they download the Erasmus app, like you follow somebody on Facebook in order to see your auras in the free program. But it's you know just a super cool um, thing that they can do. By the way, I had a student do this and he did business cards and, and used the Erasmus app. And when he handed out the business cards at a job fair, he said, I know you're getting a lot of CVs, but just go ahead and use the Erasmus app and you'll get a copy of my CV as well as me talking through some of the key points you should consider. Like, who doesn't want to hire that guy, right? Okay, here's another thing that I really love in my classroom, and that's having students create presentations. I want them to get in depth, think critically, work in teams and groups. So rather than um, just having my students create PowerPoint presentations, I, had, I use some technologies that they might like, like create um, cartoons through Paltoon, use Haiku Deck, they love that. Um, if you teach a course that's more quantitative in nature, so I was teaching a fashion merchandising course and they were doing merchandise budget plans and my students would get lost in some of the algorithms and analytics, they could take a picture of what where they were lost, send it to me, I could open up the Show Me app write over their problem, where they went wrong, and circle it and send it back to them in real time. And then I could also upload that real quick to the website so if anybody else got stuck on that problem and they could send it to each other. So, you know, that this kind of like show me or screen chomps, another example of one you can do. These kinds of technologies that provide the students with that immediate feedback. All right, two more, and then I promise we're going to have some time for questions. Plickers is another one that I love in class. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I use something like Poll Everywhere, where you allow your students to do polling on their cell phones, I love it. But sometimes my students get lost in their cell phones. Somebody sends them a message. All of a sudden, they're texting someone. So Plickers allows you to have the technology and your students to have a paper. You go to plickers.com. 
you print out these what kind of look like QM codes. There's an A on the top and a B, C, D, and you ask the students questions and they hold their paper up. If, is it a B? They hold the B up on top. You take your cell phone, scan the room, and the real live analytics show up on the board. I've done this with a group as large as 200 people and it will scan about 95% of them in less than a minute. So think if you've got a smaller group, but the student has the paper, you're the one doing the polling, but you get those real live analytics. It's great for formative assessment. Um, do students understand this concept? Am I ready to move on to the next one? Do I need to give another example? So this is a really fun one where you keep the technology, the students have the paper, but you're still engaging them in the discussion. It's a lot harder to be anonymous if you're asking everyone to participate and hold up their paper. All right. Um, this is a fun, another fun one with phones. I do a lot of photo scavenger hunts. I have class periods that are 50 minutes. I recorded a lecture ahead of time. I love Screencast-O-Matic to record lectures or, or um, Kaltura within my eBooks. And then what I had my students do is I asked them questions and they had to go around campus and take pictures. And then we came back and we discussed these pictures. So I said, where would you go to find secondary research? They knew that was research they didn't do. Probably the library is a good shirt. They all run out, take a picture of the library. And then we come back, we compare pictures. They already have phones. You know, I don't need to give them Polaroid cameras anymore, right? And we look at those pictures as we discuss the concept, as they have an opportunity to apply that, to synthesize it, to use it, instead of just regurgitating it. All right, last but not least, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't say, I try and use what's already been created. So I don't try and create new things for my students if it's already there. And I love the kinds of things that come with, um, with my publisher's content. So for example, I use eBooks, partially because it saves my students money. They obviously have the option of, of purchasing a hard copy, but my students love eBooks because they can do things like highlight and take notes and all of that content is pulled into a, into a study hub worksheet for them. So as they learn how to annotate a chapter, it's all pulled together for them. Or if they don't know how to annotate a chapter, I can annotate the chapter for them and maybe the first chapter I do to say, here's how you identify what are the key points in this chapter. Ebooks are very interactive. They read a little short segment and then there's a video that they click on that they move to the next thing. I also like ebooks because, for example, in this MindTap ebook, I'm able to record short videos at the point of context. So the students reading along, all of a sudden, who they see, me, which I'm sure is just what they want to see, but they click on me and I talk to them in their book. Okay, you just read about this concept. Do you remember when so-and-so in class said this? This is how it relates. And I'm able to engage with them right at the point of context. Now, somebody mentioned, you know, it can sometimes be tough to get your students to watch those. When you do something like, I have to tell you my first online class, I recorded all these great videos and I could not get my students to watch them. And partly it's because there wasn't anything connected to the reading. So I love things like the concept checks where they read a little bit and then it asks them a concept check, a couple questions, technology does what it does best, it grades it, it gives them feedback and then automatically deep links it into my Blackboard gradebook. Love online homework. It's engaging, it's interactive, it's not the same. They get immediate feedback, so they're not waiting days or a week to see if they understood the concept or not. And it can link them right back to the content that they're learning in the class to ensure that they're moving forward effectively. I teach communication. This is another free resource that comes within MindTap that I love, and it's UCU. It allows my students to record speeches and projects. It allows my online students to work in groups and teams, and they can record their group sessions so that I can go back and look at them or group projects. Everyone else in the class can go through and give students comments. I pulled this as an example on the Cengage website if you want to pull it up. I wish I could share my students' examples because when they do speeches, literally there'll be hundreds of comments. And whenever they're thinking about the comment, they write it. And then as the student goes back and reviews their speech, they can see when did students comment on things? When did they uh, mention things that were interesting or exciting to them? Here's another great one. You make the decision videos and case studies. My students love videos and all of these come there. And these are adaptive case studies. So as students work in groups and teams in the classroom and watch a video and then make a change 
to the case, it act, the case adjusts and adapts to them. I don't have time to make 50 different adaptations of a case study. This does, I did this one in class and showed them how I could bankrupt a company in four bad management decisions. And of course the students love that, but for me, then when they went and did it, they were really thinking about their decisions and looking up leadership styles and getting into the content um, in the book. And there's so many great examples if you teach health, these learning labs, um, so many really terrific examples. I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite, and I asked my students, of everything that you've used this semester, what's the favorite thing that you used? And overwhelmingly, they say the app on their phone. Probably shouldn't be a surprise to me, right? They're checking their phone 66 times a day, but they love that they can read their textbook on their phone. I would not be able to do that. That font is too small. But my students love that they can read the textbook. They're much more likely, research says, to study in these smaller 10 or 15 minute time spans than like I did when I was a student where I would study four hours on a Sunday night. So they pull up their phone when they're riding the bus. They pull up their phone when they're sitting in their hammock that they've strung between two trees. Um, they play the games on there, the flashcard games. When I send students a message, it comes right to their app. And when they've linked it to my class, they can get messages from the class, what we're doing, don't forget to bring this, this is a technology free Thursday, don't forget, whatever it is, they link right there. So that's a little bit about who our students are. I know in 45 minutes I couldn't cover that much, but I just love today's students. They're exciting, they are engaging. Um, I have to tell you, Somebody just said, how do my boomers and Gen X handle the technology? Surprisingly really well. And I have to tell you, I often do group projects where I put older students in the same group as younger students. And here's the reason. My younger students are very adept and use technology quickly. I find my older students are really great critical thinkers. They don't jump to conclusions. They consider all the evidence and facts. And when the two of them work together, the older students balance the younger students out and the younger students teach the older students technology. It's such a win-win. So I just have to say this one thing. Um, Andy Rooney said, when most of us die, we'll be lucky to have three or four people that ever even remembered that we lived, with the exception of teachers who will have thousands of people that you've changed their lives forever. I just find it such an incredible privilege to get to be a college teacher.